You're in the right place, at the right time. Stretching from the distant spaceports of Black Spire and Mos Eisley, all the way to the jewel of the core at Coruscant and the bright center of the galaxy, slamming into your hollow projector like a supercharged nanoparticle of coaxium. This is the Star Wars Unfiltered Podcast. I'm your host, John. My co-host is... Jason. And we are here to bring you your very needed dose of Star Wars film, TV, book, comic, gaming, and collecting news. And little mission statement here, what is Star Wars Unfiltered? Our mission statement for the podcast is thus, to provide Star Wars fans of all segments of fandom a place where we can talk about and interact about all aspects of Star Wars, whether new or old, without fear of labeling, name-calling, or obfuscating our unique and individual certain points of view. This podcast will span the fresh new films and TV of the Disney era and the new canon, as well as the perhaps reverently remembered tales of legends long past, and the plethora of media that kept the flame alight during the dark times of the mid-80s, as well as the resurgence of the expanded universe in the 90s and beyond. Star Wars Unfiltered will be keeping one foot in the here and now, as well as one foot in the past, casting new light onto the dusty and obscure nooks and crannies of the Star Wars universe, highlighting, revisiting, and reassessing some of the more forgotten and half-remembered media, history, and fan culture that has been occasionally lost in the shrouded mists of Dagobah. A smattering of old and new content will be covered from across the tapestry of films, TV, books, comics, games, and collecting, although most importantly, the story of Star Wars as a whole, as told through its countless fans and the lens of pop culture, will be the focus. Star Wars Unfiltered will be having dialogues, debates, and discussion about each generation and how each of us have individually experienced Star Wars over the years and how those experiences have changed as time has gone on. So, here we go with Around the Galaxy Star Wars news. Um, First thing, uh, Wilford Brimley passing away and on august 1st and i'm trying to think how old was he he was like 80 something yeah geez he was and what's funny is he looked the same age throughout pretty much every film i've seen him in from 1981 to (laughs) it's kind of like leslie nielsen right yeah he, he got to a point and stopped aging right and that's and that's without any sort of you know hollywood you know, plastic surgery or anything. Right. Like somebody, somebody Old made school. the point of, like, in Mission, one of the Mission Impossible's, or even now, I don't know. Uh, Tom Cruise is the same age that Wilford Brimley was in Cocoon oh, or something like geez. that. And it's wow. like the the, <laughs> the contrast <laughs> is night and day. Yeah, that's uh, he was just like one of those guys, and he was always playing uh, kind of the grandpa character, whether it was in Cocoon or Ewoks Battle for Endor or whatever. I think the only kind of character that was different from that role that I saw him in was in the Thing, where he was the scientist uh, on the station who locked himself away or did they lock him away i forget <laughs> they they locked they locked him away because he went nuts right right but he didn't he have a mustache nuts. then that's part of the, he didn't the he didn't and actually i think when i first saw that it it took me halfway through the movie before i realized oh damn that was wilford brimley yeah um but yeah uh wilford brimley is passed away uh, condolences to his family and friends and all that. And we'll be talking more about his role in the the second Ewok movie a little bit later on. So right from the heartfelt uh, news of Wilford Brimley uh, sadly passing, right to the gutter and the trash with Ray Park and his fiasco. Um, what give give us a summation of this from from what you from your angle and what you've heard. Well, it's interesting that the internet, of course, jumps on these stories so quickly. Um, first, it, I mean, even now, 
there's articles that say it was an image, not a video. Mm. Um, but of course, it was a video. Right. Posted it late night to his Instagram, took it down a couple hours later. Like, everybody jumped on it. And his wife, since then, has issued statements saying, you know, it was a, I don't know, I, I think she said it was an accident or something like that. That's what I heard. And, of course, you know, like everything, everything's a rumor. You know, there's rumors that she was cheating on him. There's rumors that it's, you know, revenge porn. There's rumors right. that he's not going to be Darth Maul anymore. At the end of the day, it's all just rumors. And Yes, you that's know, people, true. People just need to take a step back and just wait. For yeah, I, I saw too many clickbait headlines saying kiss Darth Maul goodbye from Disney and what are they going to do with this character and this and that and and first of all let's make it clear Ray Park he's more the martial arts side of Darth Maul it, it's not like he was never a dramatic actor i don't think he ever he ever he never came from things from that angle he was a martial artist first and foremost mm -hmm. so and he never performed the voice so right he was always, and he was covered in layers and layers of face paint. So it was really just about the martial arts. And credit to Disney for at least coming back to him for his cameo and solo, because they could have gotten anybody and just kind of made it shadowy. And yes, I think we would have bought it as Maul. But um, credit to Disney for actually coming back to him after nearly 20 years for solo and then also credit to them for having him mocap the martial arts in clone Wars season seven um he did do that with the uh, ahsoka duels and stuff so that's cool and i hope whatever happens with ray whether this is real or not and again it's a total grain of salt we are not pretending that this is absolute truth or anything but um hopefully everything works out we want the best for Ray. He's we know he's a really nice guy and hopefully it's all just a misunderstanding and an accident and everything can be forgiven. But if not, then so be it and <laughs> we'll move on. I'm sure yeah, the mean, world will move on. There's nothing we can do about it. I mean, by all accounts before this, Ray was um always nice, uh interact with the fans, um happy to be a part of Star Wars, all that stuff. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, Disney has every right to do whatever they want with the the character and casting and all that stuff. So we'll just have to wait and see. That's true. And okay, in other news, the uh, new Star Wars trilogy, whatever it may be, has been slightly pushed back, I think by one or two years. I can't remember the last uh, version of years they had for this, but... Uh, well, it's, it's continually yeah. getting pushed back. It is, yeah, yeah, especially now in 2020. Uh, first movie is 2023, and then uh, two is uh, 2025, and the third one is 2027. Now, my question is, because there's been a lot of juggling with directors and movie projects, and not only that, but now COVID uh, changing things, there's been absolutely no word about Ryan Johnson's trilogy that, by, for all intents and purposes, three years ago, even before The Last Jedi came out, it was basically confirmed. Like, he signed a contract saying, I, I mean, as far as well, I know, he we, signed. <laughs> we, as, as the past has demonstrated with ep, episode nine, and solo, um, even Rogue One to an extent, uh, having been signed as the director, even shooting the movie doesn't mean you're going to finish directing that movie. Yeah, so, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but so, I mean, in the yeah. sense that it was announced, and and if it goes to the official announcement portion of things, that usually means it's ninety percent. A sure thing, I would yeah, say. Yeah, but but we also had that. Uh, there was the Ryan Johnson trilogy, and then there was also, I guess, a trilogy. I think with the um, Game of Thrones guys. Yeah, yeah. Benioff and Weiss had 
I think it was they just said multiple movies, but yeah. they they never called it a trilogy. And I think the thinking was it might have been two. And I think also the rumor was that I, maybe I don't know if it was just purely a rumor because they were dealing with sword and sorcery with Game of Thrones. It was almost a rumor that they were going to be doing a Tales of the Jedi or ancient Jedi uh, series of movies, but that might have been. There's been a lot of theories that that story group might have taken those seeds and then run with the uh, the High Republic with and and use those for those that upcoming book series. Um, but yeah, this this trilogy it, it remains to be seen who's directing what or even what it's about. But um, my only hope is that we have something new like what i love about the mandalorian is that it it doesn't rely on the crutches of too many star wars things i mean yes there's there's a cool bounty hunter and some mandalorian armor and this and that but like it's mostly about new characters new planets new situations and and, and not not jedi and not jedi thing. other than the occasional force use of of the child well but... yeah, i guess that's true but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually when when i saw that i was like no i was enjoying this non-jedi thing damn it but um no i just hope it's new things new characters uh i don't i don't mind if it connects to the skywalker saga i'm sure that it will uh in in some small way uh well big or small but you know because it can't be in a vacuum but um, yeah, it's just I want fresh new Star Wars. I don't want a Star Wars movie where there's a, a character walking up to Chewie with a medal from Yavin Four and <laughs> handing it to him. Please, yeah, you don't you don't need uh, on screen retcons and stuff or, <laughs> no. or makeup makeup medals. Uh, good God. Um, any other thoughts on this upcoming trilogy when we're in our <laughs> mid mid to late forties? <laughs> <laughs> if we're lucky, <laughs> if we're lucky. Uh, who knows? I mean, uh, I don't even know that it's been confirmed that um, uh, who's directing any of it. It's no, kinda, nothing. Uh, everything seems to be flying by the seat of their pants, or you know, at Lucasfilm. So yeah, certainly with this thing. I mean, you know, we'll we'll know. You know, COVID's got everything screwed up so it holds the puppet strings down. these days maybe 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 it's it's going to be directed three movies directed by uh or josh six. josh trank <laughs> it'll be josh yeah. trank <laughs> colin, it'll trevorrow. Be colin trevorrow and just <laughs> just to put the icing on top of the cake it'll be uh It'll be Ryan Johnson to finish <laughs> out the trilogy. <laughs> oh, good God. You know, just for shits and giggles, I actually wouldn't mind seeing that. <laughs> I don't care at this point. It's all a garbage fire. Just do it. Do it now. Uh, okay. I think that's as far as we can go. With We don't know any more about this new trilogy. It's coming. I'm sure more details will be released through probably next year because they have to start i'm sure they're doing pre-production uh now but um we hope we do, yeah we hope <laughs> <laughs> doing pre-production from home uh yeah more news as it comes and uh let's talk about galaxy's edge for a bit here because disney world opened again a couple weeks ago and i don't know if it stayed open i have not followed recently it's Recently. Yeah, Dis Disney World is still open. Uh, Hong Kong Disney closed down again. They opened and then they closed down again. Yeah. Tokyo Disney, I think, opened this week. Um, and then the uh, Disneyland and California Adventure were set to open in July, but then they were they, they sadly pushed that back, so they never opened back up. Downtown Disney is open, but not not the other right the parks. And you went to Downtown Disney very recently, right? Yes, I did. It was lovely. <laughs> it was fine. Everybody's wearing masks and sure. line, lines to get in the store, but it was great. Everything was everything was great. Everybody was pleasant. It was uh, yeah. a good time, all things considered. That's good. Um, 
Yeah, I, I saw pictures of Galaxy's Edge at Disney World, and it seemed okay. Uh, you and I kind of briefly went over it. There was partitions that were new uh, on some of the lines, and um, I think the only thing that was slightly a bummer, but there's no way around it, is you know seeing Imperial officers wear face masks. You know, but what are you going to do? <laughs> it takes you out of the immersion, but what are you well, going to do? Well, unless there's, you know, some, you know, plague on the on Bat 2 or whatever. <laughs> right. Right. Like I always say, it's the Kandorian plague. It's come yeah. back from from uh, Crix Maydeen. He he dropped it on <laughs> um, on Dental after all those May, years. Maydeen's revenge. Yeah. May, yeah. Yeah. Right. Ever since Durga the Hutt shot him in the heart. <laughs> His, his plague has come back to haunt the galaxy. Um, but yeah, I hope everything works out with Galaxy's Edge. And, I mean, God, geez, I didn't even get to go. I was all set to go in April. Uh, by by early to mid-March, literally as COVID hit, I was making plans with my dad and my sister was probably going to come down. You know, it was going to be a big thing for me turning 40 in April. It's like, yeah, we're going to go to Galaxy's Edge. The money was looking good. I was, my, I had my stimulus, but I, at that point, <laughs> I was having my tax return. And so it was going to be this big thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool. And then, you know, I'd probably meet up with you or possibly. And then, you know, Nicole would hopefully come. But uh, just, it really irks me that I, didn't get to go yet and it's just like you know but well, i'd rather it'll, i'd it'll, rather have it come together when it's safer at the end yeah of the and day. It, it, it you know it'll reopen i um i of course i've had a pass and i'm closer to the the park so yeah i i've been to galaxy's edge it's great and uh it, i didn't get a chance to get on um rise of the resistance and right i actually had the opportunity um at least once, but I was like, eh, I'll, I'll wait. I, I don't need to, 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 you know, go during the, the rush of this new ride opening and yeah. kind, kind of wish I did, but at the same time, it's fine. It'll, it'll open back up. I think they sure. had a lot of problems too. I think it was like, um, the ride was having issues and was shutting down a lot. Um, mm. so there was, I don't think that there was any guarantee, even if I went to Disneyland at that time. Oh man that I would have been able to get on it. So, but yeah, technical difficulties with mm. rise of the resistance. They got to fix their, um, their little, uh, what, what, I guess you're riding over a little, one of those little speeders, huh? That goes around like the hangers, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. With the R2 unit or R5 or whatever it is. The video I saw of it looks amazing. Like you see the walkers and, Kylo Ren, you know, puts his lightsaber through the floor or something, and there's, like, holograms, and, I mean, it looks incredible, and I can't wait to see it. Um, yeah, those those new type of rides, I think they're called 4D rides or whatever. Um, yeah. They're pretty good. I, they've got, you know, a couple at uh, Universal. The Transformers ride is, I think right. it's along those lines. I think I could be totally wrong, but right. And that's a pretty good ride. Did Transformers replace Jurassic Park? I think it did. No. It didn't. Okay. No, they just took over. I think one of the studios. Oh, or okay. Something. So. I haven't been to Universal since 1997, so <laughs> I'm a little out of date on what's over there. Other than City Walk, which I've been to a bunch, but yeah. Um, okay, that's pretty interesting. Hopefully, Galaxy's Edge is back on track for for Southern California uh, in the near future. Hopefully, before the end of the year, and if not, I guess 2021. Fingers crossed. Um, all right, Hollow Vid hookup. Here is your TV and Disney Plus news for Star Wars Unfiltered. Uh, we have The Mandalorian nominated for 15 Emmys. Um, I went down the list briefly of all the Emmys. I don't have it here. It doesn't really matter. There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Uh, most of them are technical and you know special effects and things of that sort. Um, but holy crap, that is a lot of Emmys for a brand new Star Wars show. Uh, yeah, and it's, um, I mean, it's a good show. Everybody likes it. That sure. helps. It certainly helps. Um, and uh, one of the nice things about it is, is uh, it, 
you know, the Emmys is TV, but a lot of times it's, you know, streaming platforms and not necessarily like network TV. It's like cable yeah, television and stuff. Including streaming too, <laughs> depending on the platform. Yeah, and, and just in general, the, the show really feels like something you would see on network TV. Yep. You know, they, they're going for a, a feel and a, and a motif. And it's kind of nice that something like that can still be nominated for Emmys, you know, something that's not slick um, and uh, uses sort of like movie or slash cinematic um, yeah. tropes. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, the Mandalorian, I'm going to watch it again before season two comes out in a couple months here, but um, it's weird. I, I love The Mandalorian. I, I liked it overall f far better than The Rise of Skywalker once the glitter faded on that movie. Um, but at the same time, I'm in a weird position where I think s sections of The Mandalorian are overrated. And I think some of that was just an anti or negative reaction to Rise of Skywalker. I think people were perhaps unnecessarily inflating the magnificence magnificence of the Mandalorian in, in 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 certain ways i think i think the beginning episodes are amazing and i think the ending episodes are amazing and there's one or two pretty good ones in the middle but there was a couple that were and i get it they're going for the western motifs and the samurai motifs and maybe it's because i just know those inside and out and i've seen them so much but it was very by the book on some of those themes and i was just like oh here's the woman who falls in love with the mandalorian and he takes off his mask and no he's too cold-hearted he can't love her he ha he's a mercenary he's gonna go back to fighting he doesn't care and it was just like Ugh, i've seen this in so many so many westerns it's just like well it's okay it's, it's kind of like the the wilhelm scream right they have to sort of <laughs> insert that yeah regardless and they they do it as kind of a true true maybe maybe it's kind of an in joke but uh, these series in general um i mean almost every television series yeah streaming or otherwise it's gonna have like filler episodes yeah so and the actually the, even though and it, what's funny is when there's a filler episode that then pays off later and that did happen a little bit on this one where you know, we, throughout the series, we kept going, where's Cara Dune? Where's Cara Dune? She's in all the promotion and all the advertising, and then we finally see her, and then he leaves her on that planet, and it was like, oh, whatever. But then they all the characters did come together at the end. You had Kawil, you had uh, IG, what's the number? <laughs> I forget <laughs> the uh, IG number. Uh, it's not IG-72, that's from, that's from Legends. Um... But anyway, yet all of them come together, and I, I feel like that was a really good feeling because you you individually experience them uh, uh, throughout each of the the single episodes, and um, but yeah, and and Rebels did the same thing where there was filler episodes or what seemed like filler, and then later on you're like, oh, that really did connect to this larger arc of things. Um, so, well, and and when you're yeah. when you're fleshing out a story, something can feel even if it doesn't have a payoff later, it can feel like a filler episode because not much happens as far as yeah. the over the overall story and the, right. the greater the greater arc. But yeah. it's still necessary to like sort of paint the picture of the character, or the characters, yeah. and like yes. motivations and all that stuff. That's you know? very true, and I, I guess that's something I do love about these Disney Plus series is that they can. Um, spend more time developing these characters rather than just throw them into a two-hour star wars movie um i'm really looking forward to the cassie and andor series maybe more than anything lately i think i think for me personally it's because i love the pre a new hope era of like five years before new hope mm -hmm. and i love the tech and the ships and the design and I, I don't know. I think it's from all the years of playing Dark Forces and X-Wing. I love 
all the little cells of rebellion that meet up and connect and and lead to the Death Star plans and all that stuff. So I'm really excited. I am um, so tired of that that period. That <laughs> you're burned <laughs> out. I, I am burned out. I'm still burned out from from it's the old EU and stuff. It, it is. Well, I'll tell you what. It's less stuffed than the post A New Hope period which even now with Marvel is extremely saturated. But here's the problem with that. The reason those two eras are stuffed is because, well, it's kind of easy to figure out. That's We can visually depict it in a comic or go back to it in a novel because that's classic Star Wars. That's mm-hmm. like, we can see young Han, Luke, and Leia. We can see you know mon mothma and everybody in akbar and oh it's like all those familiar things it's x-wings and tie fighters and and walkers and um it's just that familiarity of classic star wars yeah of course so you know and actually for comics especially it is really nice when you see an artist that can really draw the characters as they appear in the movies like mm-hmm. make it look like carrie fisher make it look like harrison ford and some of these marvel artists are doing a great job of um really depicting them uh, looking just like the actors so it is fun but yeah it, it it's an era that's that is a bit saturated uh, that's and, just that's just a personal you know yeah. taste yeah difference not <laughs> i i was never I, I even even when it was fresh in the old EU and stuff, I was never that was not my yeah the, the period of time I wanted to learn more about. It was always post what? post, it was Return, post of the Return of the Jedi. Jedi? Yeah. yeah, let's have a super weapon every year. Oh that, yeah, it has its own way. <laughs> post Return has its own issues, at least in the old EU. Yeah, and that and that's a funny thing that has come up on. Um, I heard them talk at length about that on uh, some of the other uh, Star Wars popular podcasts. There, there was the how how has the expanded universe changed over the years? And in the '90s, before the prequels were even out, there was this sense that okay, we want to see beyond the movies. What do we do? So you have to make the stories almost as epic in scale as the classic trilogy. Otherwise, they just don't seem very important. So you have to have the return of the emperor. You have to have, you know, a, a grand admiral unite the imperial fleet and fight mm-hmm. back and take the capital. Or you have to have uh, the Death Star prototype. <laughs> you know, right? Or... <laughs> yeah. Every every revision. Every revision. And so, I guess also that that has been. A blessing and a curse for the new canon because it seemed like so much of the sequel trilogy was hitting the same beats as the old expanded universe it was like i think my first thing i said to you when we were watching force awakens when we saw the shadow going over the planet i was like oh it's the eclipse you know palpatine's old uh, cruiser yeah. So <laughs> it's just like, yeah, you got all this stuff, and um, well, it was it was another super weapon, another super weapon, an even bigger was, Death Star, and an then, even bigger Death Star, and then, was, and then and then in uh, the Rise of Skywalker, it was the Death Star times a thousand, <laughs> right? So <laughs> yeah, I mean, as as much as they wanted to or get away from the old eu it's still they still brought back failure. super weapons failure yeah i mean it is what it is i guess um i i we'll go into probably sequel thoughts more in detail at another time but yes anyway uh and we'll probably go more in depth on on uh post return of the jedi expanded universe so i'll swing back to this little bit of news which is actually not technically official news yet but it is rumors of a disney plus series focusing on lando and or han um it seems like there was quotes from various people 
uh, under the radar, sort of, that then came to light that there was there's been speak, there's been dialogue between Lucasfilm and possibly Donald Glover and um, Alden Ehrenreich. And uh, yeah, what, what do you think if if uh, Solo Two became just a Disney Plus series? Would you? It'd be, be great. Down? It it makes sense from a budgeting standpoint, and with the pandemic and all that stuff, it's probably safer to uh make something that that props up your streaming platform versus something that you have to hopefully re you know uh release in a theater at some right. point um so i'd like to see it i really liked solo um it took me a while but i've kind of warmed up to alden aaron reich's yeah. uh yeah uh, han solo and uh Glover was good as as Lando, so I'd like to see more of him. Um, and yeah. you know, hopefully, maybe see more of uh, Ray Park as a uh, yes as Maul, and uh, of course uh, Kira. See more Kira. Amelia yeah, Clark. I, th I I think it was you know Solo over the, it's it's only been two years now, just over two years since it came out, and it's weird. It, from the dialogue I've had with fans and various people online and you and, and other friends and stuff, it seems like Solo has almost become this underground hit among Star Wars fans where because of the mixed reaction of the sequels, there almost seems to be like this thing where like really the hardcore like EU kind of people we really like solo and i i think it's a like maybe it's because we maybe it's because we like everything star wars and we have no we have no <laughs> barometer for quality <laughs> but, <laughs> besides that besides the fact that we're nutcases for these things i think there was every time i watched the movie and i i've probably seen it now all together maybe nine times or something um it it gets better every time once you get the rhythm of it and the editing is tight the story is tight the humor is really good it was i remember like walking out of that movie and like telling you and everyone like nicole it was like that was the funniest star wars movie i think i've seen since rogue one which was the other favorite i feel yeah and the action was great and it was so nice other than the brief mall appearance to not see any Jedi, not have any big epic, you know, galactic events, just have it focus on smaller adventures. And the thing I keep going over on it is that it felt like an Indiana Jones movie, but Star Wars. So yeah. it was like the old movie serial kind of thing where we're going to go from one event to the other. All the action set pieces were timed just right. The humor was on point. Um, but yeah, solo. It's there's this upswell of of fandom for it since it came out, and there was the whole hashtag last year, make solo two or whatever the hashtag was. Yeah, bring solo two out, and um, and there's there's even been quotes from Ron Howard over the last week or two where he he said he would you know there's been no plans on his end, but he would love to see it happen and. Um, I think also the great thing about Disney Plus is, once again, just like talking about The Mandalorian, it gives you more time to develop the character. And so, you know, how many adventures has Han had before New Hope? Probably many. So, you know, we could see all his uh, jobs he did for Jabba the Hutt and all the smuggling stuff and run-ins with Imperials that he's had. Um, I mean, gosh, if if everything was done good it could lead right up to a new hope you know potentially uh yeah or or they could uh pull a ridley scott and uh and make it just veer off into left field like uh, with prometheus <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> but uh you know the interesting thing about um the the upswell and the the fan reaction after the fact is before you would have a movie would come out and maybe it'd do well or maybe it'd not do so well in the theater, but then through video sales and video rentals, um, it would make money yes. on, uh, you know, post theatrical. 
And I don't know how much that's true nowadays with like streaming and stuff. I don't, yeah, you know, I, there's very true. plenty of people still buying Blu-rays and stuff, but I don't know how much that can uplift a, a movie after it's Dummies like run. me are still buying, buying Blu-ray. Right. Yeah. So, but, <clears throat> but certainly they could track, you know, how many people watched it on streaming a lot better than, you know, if it was playing on TV and stuff. So Disney can totally see, um, what sort of viewership it has. Yeah. Um, on, I think it was on Netflix, but I think it's, has it moved over to Disney plus yet? Pretty sure know. it's on Disney plus now. Cause I, <clears throat> I almost remember the ads when it was popping up as a sponsored link. But they, they can totally see. So, you know, if, if you like it and you want to see more than, uh, you know, fall asleep to it at night, I'm sure on <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wherever it is. Just like I do with Lord of the Rings all the yeah. time. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, I hope, I I really hope it happens. And hey, we could get more pre and a hope stories out of that. So just like, <laughs> yeah, your favorite thing all over I mean, again. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't not like it. It's just <laughs> kind of kind of tired of it. That's all. You know, but you know, if funny. they if they do okay, if they do make uh, either Solo Two or a series, they need to bring Ron Howard back. But they should halfway through either filming the movie or the series, fire Ron Howard and bring Lord and Miller back, <laughs> and they can finish off this one. <laughs> It'll bookend. It'll bookend <laughs> everything. Yeah. It's yeah, the, why not? It's the mirror. mirror why not? <laughs> Seriously, make sure to give Han a little goatee and everything just to have it like Spock. Um, yeah, you, you know, also it would be great just like The Mandalorian, have some different directors of different episodes, have give their spin on uh, Han and Lando and uh, see what they do with the character. And I think more than anything... What I really loved in Solo, and I would love to see in a potential series, is more connections to the old EU. You know, there was a little bit in Solo as far as the Lando Calrissian Chronicles, how he, you know, he's that whole thing where he, there was three references to the Lando adventures in that movie, mm -hmm. which blew my mind. Being such a big fan of that book series, as, as I know you are, yes. and. Th that just blew my mind, you know, that he mentioned uh, Oseon and uh, the Thon Boca and the and and uh, the the Toka and all that stuff, and then Nova Fira, but yeah, Nova okay. Fira, you know. It would have been great if he was the droid, but you know maybe they got rid of L three so that Vuffy Ra could be the next droid that he finds. There uh, you go, yeah. <laughs> and actually, he has another droid in Rebels when he showed up on one or two uh, he was on like two episodes of rebels and they got yes. billy d and he had another droid and that takes place uh closer to a new hope it's about four years or so give or take and um yeah so lando has been going through quite a, quite a few droids over the years so yeah i guess that says something about his uh relationships he just treats them like With crap. Women, and then, women, and droids. It, it, women he just and goes, droids goes right through. Them. <laughs> oh, Lando, you're my hero. Um, so that that's some interesting news there. I hope that comes true with Disney Plus. And if anything, we usually get announcements like this when there's rumors that build up like that. It's usually a couple weeks before official announcements. So. Well, August, I, I feel I like sometimes, sometimes when these these uh, quote unquote rumors come out, it's they're officially leaked to to gauge fan true. reaction. I think very true. I think that that happens. I, I think kind of the same thing happened with Kenobi uh, last year, where I think it was same same deal, mid to late July, early August. It, it kind of filtered out. And then the I think they had D23 last year, and then that was when it was officially announced. So, and um, I guess we'll briefly talk about Kenobi here. We might as well since we're doing Holovid hookup. And um, there's been not a lot of news on Kenobi. I think for various reasons. I think the pandemic halted production for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, it's still. I think it was still set to come out next year, at least. And uh, I think 
I, I don't know what's going to happen with that series. It's going to be interesting. I'm really enthusiastic about Ewan McGregor coming back um, because he's really embraced Obi-Wan. Um, it, it's just nice to see him come back to it. And you got the feeling after the prequels that, well, you know, just like every Star Wars actor, we've talked about this before, they're ready to move on. You know, they yeah. do three movies, and they're so intense, and there's so much promotion. They're so hyped. You're ready to move on. But now it's been 15 years, and Ewan is back. And I think he's at that age where he's he wants to revisit the character, you know? Yeah, I mean, any any actor on any movie can get burned out, even on a single, even on a single movie, let alone a, a series. Like no Star, kidding. Like any Star Wars movie. Yeah, no kidding. And... I wonder if or how it's going to tie into, you know, like, are they going to, is Darth Maul going to be a part of that? You know, they're, they're, because we see him face off with Maul in Rebels when he, when, uh, spoiler alert, uh, Darth Maul dies. Um, but, yeah, it's been three years or four years, I can say that. Right, uh, yeah. Um... But yeah, yeah so. it would be nice to it, it would be cool to see that in in live action that scene yeah. from Rebels. Um, yeah, I don't or, know where you fit it in, but even if they just had an encounter of some kind years before, where Maul is tracking Obi Wan or something like that, and then likewise building up Crimson Dawn. Um, yeah, they could go so many different directions. All we can do is speculate. Um, all we do know is that it sets. Uh, I believe at 11 years before A New Hope, uh, I'd have to check my notes, but so it's almost smack in the middle between uh, Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, which would pretty much perfectly line up with Ewan McGregor's age, because uh, I think he's around 50. I think he's about 10 years older than us, I think. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if I wonder if they're going to add some makeup on him or some CG to make him uh, be more Tatooine aged. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know if they'd bother with that. I mean, certainly they'd probably, probably not. gray his hair would probably be enough. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if they if he goes off world at all. That and, uh, is going to be the interesting thing. I think a lot of debate uh, from fans about whether he abandons Luke temporarily, you know. Uh, I just hope that they um, occasionally throughout the, the series, they just cut away to to Yoda sitting on Dagobah doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> just cook, cooking some, some Dagobah stew. Right. <laughs> just chilling. Playing with lizards and have his little snake friend and yeah I, I could see i could see them uh maybe actually having obi-wan and yoda you know communicate some way either the force. via the force or or whatever and and maybe actually cover um you know what if anything yoda does on dagobah because obviously he probably doesn't gallivant around the galaxy after the fact he goes in exile right. and he stays there but you know there's always been questions about the cave and all that stuff and yeah why he chose dagobah and and all that stuff so very true they, I, I could see them covering that too yeah yeah i don't see why not and it and, would and be... maybe maybe getting liam neeson back and yes having qui-gon you know commune with or having obi-wan commune with qui-gon via i honestly you know, don't think that's an issue at all because i mean after all liam neeson came back for clone wars and voiced his character for at least one or two episodes of the mortis arc um mm -hmm. in some uh force visions so yeah i, I could see liam coming back for a, a very special project like this and um yeah whether a force ghost or just his voice even it'll, it'll um, even say in the credits will be very special guest <laughs> liam neeson yeah or like at the end of every star wars movie whenever there's a special actor it'll say and it'll yeah. like it'll just be them and then and like uh peter cushing or yeah. and christopher lee um it's always the regal uh more established <laughs> the legitimate actors, actors. <laughs> legitimate actors <laughs> 
<laughs> that is B movie crap. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So cool. Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to Kenobi. These various Disney Plus series. More news on those as they come. Uh, now let's do a little retrospective. We're going from the uh, new Disney Plus and current canon all the way back to the mid 80s and the Ewok adventures. Um, we both revisited these a couple nights ago. I, I've i seen them more than you over the years. I th- you hadn't seen them since you were a kid, right? Correct. Oh and my I, gosh. And I, even even the other day, I couldn't I couldn't sit down and watch uh, Caravan of Courage. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. Oh, it's slow. Don't worry, I'll, I'll fill everybody in on more details on that. But um, wh- what were your thoughts going back to it after 30, 30 to thirty five well, plus years? As as I said about the uh, Battle for Endor is is one one and a half hours, and about one hour <laughs> in, I felt like. I I felt like I was watching the Fellowship of the Ring, and <laughs> it was time to put the second disc in. It uh, felt that long, and that's usually the point where it's so funny. I've watched Fellowship in halves so much over the years. <laughs> it's especially if you're with a girlfriend and she's kind of like half paying attention. It's like ah, oh, we'll just go to bed after the first half. It's fine. Right. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, it, it was it's slow. It, it's okay. It's just you know. It, nothing nothing really happens you know it's nothing not nothing mind blowing it's thin it's just thin it's it's an ewok movie it's fine it's an ewok movie and what i found funny i do like battle for endor more and i think when i <laughs> what's funny is i don't i don't remember if i saw it in full in the 80s i do and and here here we'll go back to some old old dim and distant Star Wars memories. As a kid, I I had the e the first one. I had Caravan of Courage taped off TV. Uh, my mom taped it. I do. Re- I'm pretty sure I saw it as it was taped, and that mm-hmm. was in November 1984. I think it came out around Thanksgiving. Um, it turns out that that. VHS is the oldest VHS in my collection. It it was one that we what, held what on to. What an honor! Yeah, what an what honor! Honor, yeah. Man of courage, thank you. Um, it happens to be the oldest that I personally have held on to. I don't think my mom or dad has any older tapes. And what's funny is, I rediscovered it when I was getting hardcore into Star Wars in 1994, 95. I rediscovered that tape, and it wasn't, or I think it was written on there, but it was kind of fading ink, and it was on a red ink, and it was kind of fading, and I think, I was like, I think that says Ewok Adventure. Oh, yeah, I remember this. And I remember I popped it in, and I watched it, and this was in 1995, and I had been reading the EU for about a year, and I was absorbing everything voraciously, (laughs) and I was so excited to see new even if it was old, new Star Wars that I hadn't watched every day besides the trilogy. So I was just like, oh, Ewok movie, I'm so I'm so for this. And I'm watching it, and it was very slow and plodding, and it was kind of schmaltzy with, with Mace and Sindel, and the dialogue wasn't that great, and it was just kind of very, very basic, but I was so enthused because it was new. And it was about one hour in... Just as Mace is like shooting his blaster at a rock to make this cave entrance open up to where they can get into the Gorax cave to save uh, his parents, right as the rock blows up, the tape cuts off and it's an MTV concert (laughs) of the Blasters, which is an old rockabilly band that Uh my parents were into. Apparently, my mom, probably like a month after ewok adventure aired my mom had to quickly grab a tape throw it in and hit record to record this blasters concert so the you, end you, you know what that reminds me of is uh yeah. Eep, uh gremlins 2 when the i don't know if you've seen gremlins 2 i've lately, but still not seen gremlins when, 2. oh oh well there's a scene where the gremlins are watching a movie just like they do in the first one but then mm-hmm. it it uh 
it cuts away <laughs> to uh, to Hulk Hogan. <laughs> nice. And he he taught you know he talks to the Gremlins because they or no they they mess up the move. They're watching Gremlins too, I think, and then they mess up the screening of Gremlins too. Okay. And then Hulk Hogan has to you know talk to the Gremlins and right. stuff. But I I still got to see Gremlins too. But uh, so it was just funny to watch this tape and actually watch it multiple times in 1995 and be like, damn it, I don't have the end of the Ewok adventure. Um, but then it was a few months later, I just went to my local video store, Ojai Video, and they had the VHS. I rented that, saw the end of it. But then more importantly, they had Battle for Endor there, and I had forgotten... Because again, this was, I didn't have the internet at this point. This is the mid 90s, and internet wasn't common for you youngins. And, and uh, I was like, oh yeah, there was a second Ewok movie. And, um, you know, it had Wilford Brimley on the cover, and, and uh, it was kind of a witch looking character, and, and this strange creature named Tarak. And so I, I rented that one, and because it had more action, than the first one, even though it was still very slow and very TV budget and everything, I vastly enjoyed it more. And I was like, wow, this is actually pretty good. And it was a little tighter on the editing. And um, I mean, it, it, if you look back at it now, <laughs> especially compared to like Star Wars TV we have now and Clone Wars and all this stuff, it, it it really was the dark times of Star Wars fandom when you can get excited about an Ewok television movie. Which well, I, had... I just, I wouldn't, uh, I couldn't even imagine going and seeing that in the theater because I think it was released theatrically in it Europe. It was in Europe. And, but I mean, that's, it, it's funny because for me, the dark times of Star Wars, for me, that, that w was actually the 90s also because, yes, we had Dark Horse comics. Yes, we had Bantam novels. Yes, we were getting the beginning of some really good LucasArts games, but as far as like beyond the, the classic trilogy, we, all we had was some bootlegged droids episodes of the cartoon. We had some Ewoks, you know, we had Ewok movies. It was like if you wanted other media and you were desperate and you're, and you're just scouring for stuff, it was like, oh my God, you'll take whatever you can get. You know, it was like it was like the meme of uh, fucking um, uh, Dave Chappelle. Like, you, you got any more of that Star Wars shit? You know, he's got cocaine. Yeah, in his yeah lips. totally. <laughs> and that's what they could throw together, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it was good to revisit it. And what's funny though, when you <laughs> when you watch it, is Wilford Brimley's character of Noah. He is such an asshole to Sindel, and 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 Wicket. Yeah. Like, uh, okay, because imagine, he, he's stranded on Endor for probably, let's say he's 60. He's And it, he talks about at the end of the movie, he and his friend Salek wanting to tear up the galaxy. And, like, they just got a ship. And so you got to imagine they're 20 years old or something. Yeah. So he's been on Endor for roughly 40 years plus. And then he comes across this little girl in an Ewok. I'm sure he's seen Ewoks. He lives on Endor. But there's this little girl with no parents. And he's like, what are you doing here? Get out of my house. You know, like, <laughs> don't you think he'd want to, like... Right, like, it's, like, normal. Like, <laughs> like, it's just like, oh, these kids. These, yeah, these, these darn kids, kids get off my these lawn. Human, these human kids running around on Endor. <laughs> You know, it's like, what What did he go through? I, I want to see the Noah prequel story where, where he, he's terrorized by children or something. You know, like... We, we like, never got that, did we? Even we in a comic no, or anything. We never... There was never any... You know, and I... What's... I feel they could. Uh, you know, like, I'm... I'm really a fan of obscure EU. Like thing, I love seeing Star Tours references in, like in Tie Fighter. There was a shuttle. It was like Star Tour Seven or something. Yeah, it helps um, legitimize. It helps know, legitimize, just... and it feel it makes everything feel that much more interconnected. Just yes. like the Lando adventures being referenced in Solo. I I would love to see a Noah short, just a short story. Oh, or better yet, I was thinking of this as I watched the Ewok movies. 
I would love to see a Tales from Endor anthology. Just a short story about you could have an Imperial officer, a scout trooper, and him scouting so the planet. A lot of Ewoks. There's a lot of Ewoks, but you know, it, it wouldn't have to be Ewok focused. Have have let's say a couple Ewok stories, maybe Wicket and another one. Let's have an Imperial scout. Let's have Noah and Salak, and when they crashed, let's have Sindel's parents, the Tawanis, and how they crashed on the planet. Um, or yeah, better, it's just in in the in the vein of the of the classic tales of yes, the books. yes. So like you know the Cantina and and Jabba's yeah. Palace. They you know every sort of background character. Absolutely, got a story. Just, it, it, it doesn't have to be a but, lot. Make it make it eight stories or something, or six sto- even just some yeah. little novellas. I would just love to see that, even if it was just an ebook or something. Um, yeah, maybe well, you I'll know, be you know what one. that means. What if they do if they do that, then that canonizes almost Absolutely. all but canonizes the Ewok movies. Absolutely, as, as they should be with the cinematic masterpieces they are. Right. So, yeah, no, it's it's. They're an interesting little nugget of the EU that I, unless you were a child of the 80s like us, I almost feel like people forget them. You know, they, they, not a lot of people talk about them. Not that there's a lot to talk about with them. They're very simple, but. Well, as um, a a kid, I just saw them on, I think the Disney channel. Yes. Oh, Disney channel. Going back to what I was going to say earlier. My earliest memory of Battle for Endor, and again, I don't remember if I saw it in full in the 80s. I do remember being at my friend's house, uh, my friend Travis, who he was the first person I knew that had the Star Wars trilogy on video, um, and he had all the, all the Kenner toys. I remember watching the Disney Channel at his house and seeing a promo for Battle for Endor, and it was already four or five years old at that point because Disney Channel would just constantly show kind of older stuff. Mm-hmm. But and I remember the shot of the ship taking off and flying over Teak and Wicket over their heads. I, I distinctly recall that that uh, that little angle there. Um, so my memory of it was kind of dim and distant, and I kind of remembered the hang glider sequence. There was that whole thing. Oh, yeah. and before I forget, Phil Tippett did the stop motion in that, just as he did for the classic trilogy and Ed Two Hundred Nine and RoboCop. So yeah, the you know the overall the special effects are pretty decent for a TV good. movie back then. Yeah, they are pretty good for TV, and and the the blurg in Caravan of Courage, which uh, we see later in the Mandalorian, that's the the big green creature that uh, he rides at mm-hmm. the uh, of yeah. Knott's farm. That came from Caravan of Courage, and it was also in, or did it? Was it Battle for Endor? It was one of the Ewok movies. I know they it, they had him in in Battle for Endor. Yeah, they I'm were in sure. that. I I can't remember if they're in Car- Caravan of Courage now. That I think about it, but um. Those came from the Ewok movies, and then, of course, Dave Filoni used them again in Clone Wars on Ryloth. The Twi'leks, a couple of the Twi'leks rode them, and then they were again used in Rebels, again on Ryloth. And that was just cool. It was like, oh, it's a blurg. Not awesome. Another little obscure EU thing. Um, And then, uh, oh yeah, I was going to say... Eric Walker, who played Sindel's brother in the first movie, and briefly in the second movie before he and the parents are wiped out, um, he has actually put together a little making of the Ewok movies documentary because he was given he and Warwick Davis were given cameras during uh, on the set, and they were mm-hmm. kind of given the task of filming some behind the scenes stuff so if you look on youtube he's put together like a 12 minute little miniature documentary on his personal youtube channel um it's pretty cool i skimmed over it i haven't watched the whole thing yet but it's a nice little snapshot of that that time and place and they filmed everything in northern california 
around Marin County, which you can kind of tell if you see if you see it. It's like, you know, there's something about Northern California. And it's just like, oh yeah, there's you got the redwoods and yeah, those those low rolling hills and. I think but, he's he's um, petitioning or or you know trying to get the the Ewok movies onto D- uh, Disney Plus. Right, he's saying put them out on Blu-ray, put them on Disney Plus. Well, I don't, I don't know do if whatever we Blu-ray, but I don't I don't even know if they if they would have the right aspect ratio and everything because I I don't think they do because if you if you look at any clip of them, it's very it's a square box with the sides kind of cut off and because uh, they were filmed for just TV aspect at the time. but Well, certainly they, they could uh, block they, them for they could fake it if they wanted to. But, I mean, that's not that's not any sort of, like, technical hurdle they yeah. would need to... Damn it, I want to, to see my Ewok Blu-ray. movies in absolutely 4K. God damn it. Get on that, Disney. Let's do this. No, no uh, thanks. <laughs> I, I bought them on DVD when they got released Did you? back in, what, 15 years ago or something? I think it was and 2004. I, think I it bought was. them, and they went on the shelf, and I never watched them. You never watched them? <laughs> I and, never and, sat down and watched them. And, you know, well, I, that's how it is. That's generally how it goes. And I don't think that DVD had any extras. It m- may have had a trailer. I don't think it did, though. I think it was just, and it might have even been dual-sided. Because uh, it was two on I one. I believe it was. I believe yeah. it was. <laughs> they couldn't even bother to give them the right, <laughs> uh, you know, quality on individual discs. But hey, at least it did come out on DVD. It wasn't just a VHS only thing. That's cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, interesting little movies. Uh, near the end of Battle for Endor, there's little. There's other little Easter eggs. Again, I was skimming YouTube, and there's a few little documentaries people put together. And I guess Terax Throne is pieces of, like, two speeder bikes from Return of the Jedi. Literally just stripped down and pieced together, and that's his throne, which I never noticed. And then um, the dungeon area, part of it is made from pieces of the temple of doom dungeon from from that movie the uh in fact the thing that lowers down the guy into the lava yeah is like part of the uh part of that dungeon in there and i guess there's a bunch of other things and that makes sense because i think they filmed i mean they were filmed around the same time it was like 84 85 um Hey, penny penny saved is a penny earned. That's right. In Hollywood, for sure. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, Disney movies or, or sorry, Ewok movies. Uh, yeah, they're. It was fun to revisit them, but they're not something I go back to a lot. It's like an every five to ten to fifteen year thing for me. Um, I I think. I mean, I I didn't watch Caravan of Courage. I didn't rewatch that, but and I'm sure it's the same issue, but. Battle for Endor, it would have a better soundtrack would have gone a long way, and that I think yeah. that's something that a lot of TV movies. Yeah, lack. it has a very basic soundtrack, but and even even some Hollywood movies, you watch them from that time period, the mid '80s, and mm-hmm. if it, some of them sound like it, like a TV movie, like the I soundtrack know. just sounds like a TV movie, and you're like, I know, it's very Shop basic. Yeah, um, I think uh, Peter Bernstein did the music. Um, I, I think he had been a TV score guy for years, and um, I think he'd done a few movies. But actually, I found in the early 2000s on eBay, there was an Ewoks soundtrack CD, which surprised me because I thought it was only available on vinyl. And I, I won the auction, and I got it, and it was... It was one of those weird things where it was like a semi-official release from Europe, but it was mm-hmm. like it had bonus tracks that were basically the Ewok celebration music from Return of the Jedi. Yeah, and it was just a very. I think it really wasn't official, but it used all the official, you know, imagery and sound, and I don't know, just a weird disc, and uh, I still have it somewhere. Um, but anyway, yeah, we could go on forever with the Ewok movies. I think we kind of covered them. I don't think there's anything else 
too super interesting. Um, but yeah, check them out if you've never seen them. Uh, let's see. We'll move on to uh, the bookshelf. Book news and reviews. Uh, mostly covering some brief news here. It's been kind of slow as Star Wars book news through the year, but just the past uh, week or so, uh, Myths and Fables Expanded Edition has come out, which is exclusive to Galaxy's Edge, this new version, which I think the, the, the last one came out last year. This one adds six new stories, I believe, but it's only at Galaxy's Edge. So presumably eBay. only... Well, presumably only florida <laughs> yeah only florida or ebay yeah so if in other words if you want some fresh covid in the mail uh you know order this new myths and fables anthology um i know there's already rumblings of and grumblings of fans going i just bought the hardback one last year and now i gotta get this one but it's only a galaxy's edge and everyone's just like ebay 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 um I don't think it would be too hard to probably get the new one. Um, when I do get it, I'll probably just, you know, either wait till I, it opens up and I do go there or, or eBay, whichever works out. Um, but this book and Dark Legends, which just came out uh, this last week, they both kind of follow the uh, interesting style of doing in-universe mythological stories, which... Is really a cool idea and was only done a tiny, tiny bit in Legends. So, yeah, very. It, it, um, it would be interesting, I think, if they sort of adapted some of the old Legends stories into Legends myths. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As as quote unquote Legends in uh, in the new expanded universe. Yeah, actually. Tying back into Battle for Endor, <laughs> and <laughs> apparently I was I was skimming over, you know the the few appearances that uh, Sindel has made in the EU. She was uh, briefly seen in Tyrant's Test actually as a New Republic reporter um, who helps break a new a, a galaxy wide news net story or whatever but beyond that there was a later book i think in the legacy of the fourth series that someone is and i haven't read it but someone is watching a hollow vid of something and um they say that they're watching a hollow of uh an ewok that speaks really good basic and is talking to a, a little girl on on indoor and so it's basically saying battle for indoor is an in-universe hollow drama so <laughs> That was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, the, I don't see why they couldn't just adapt Legends for for some of these things. Certain, um, certain stuff would work pretty well, I think. Yeah, just tidbits. It, I mean, you don't have to do like whole, you know, whole stories or whole trilogies, but certain tales of the Jedi, are, maybe tales of the Jedi. Um, yeah, maybe things like that, or you know, Star Wars doesn't have. Um, a huge reliance on supernatural um, stories, but I would love to see some more. Um, there's been inklings over the years. There's been little pieces. The the old Marvel comics of the early 80s had a few kind of ghost story kind of things. Oh, and <laughs> well, of course, Tales from Vader's Castle, which we'll get to uh, momentarily. Um, but yeah, those those books are out. Check them out. I still need to read them. I think you still need to read them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of want to read my Galaxy's Edge tie-in uh, stuff before I go, and those uh, those have connections to Galaxy's Edge. Um, and then uh, there's a Mandalorian tie-in novel coming out. It was come due to come out, I think, in September. It's been delayed to November 2nd. Uh... We briefly talked about this before the podcast. Um, what could it be about? If you had to speculate, what do you think? I Is it confirmed whether or not it's like a collection of stories or if it's just a novel? I think it's a novel. That's, yeah. that's what I'm hearing. It's not an so, anthology. So I, I could see it just being 
pre Mandalorian. Yeah. That's what I was kind of thinking. Maybe um C- certainly not post. I mean, what else could it be, right? I mean, yeah, it's not yeah. gonna be post Mandalorian. <laughs> right. You can't it's it's not gonna if it's not an anthology of stories uh covering yeah. different characters, which would be pretty nice, but at the same time I'm sure that season two will explore the ba- the backgrounds of, of these characters more. Um True. It, it could just be, you know, the uh his his origin story right like i think that it can't be anything but that and especially if they're going to call it the mandalorian you know colon whatever um because yeah I, yeah they could have it focus on different characters but then it's not really a mandalorian tie-in novel so it's got to be his previous adventures probably with that smuggling crew or those those bounty hunter guys um probably them plus a couple other things yeah, that's, that's actually, my guess. since you mentioned it, it's probably something like that where it doesn't it it doesn't delve into what they might want to cover in yeah. season two. Like if they go uh, show more flashbacks to his right, his I'm sure origin. there's absolutely because they do this with the story group does this with every new movie and and book project. There will probably be Easter eggs to season two in it. But we won't know that until after season two, because they did the yeah. same thing with it was kind of amazing little teeny tiny things they dropped into media sometimes two years before a movie. Um, Crate was mentioned in the Rogue One visual guide in December 2016. Well, I guess that mm-hmm. was one one year before Last Jedi. But when it was, it was just dropped in on a little bio on a background character. And it was like, no one knew. It was just like, oh, okay. There's a planet called Crate. Cool. But then it was funny because then we learned more about The Last Jedi. We saw the movie. Holy crap. They dropped that in there like way in advance. Um, so there's been little things like that that they've done. And so I'm, I'm sure that this tie-in novel will have little easter eggs like that and um i'm looking forward to it i i would i really want to read it it's just a bummer that by the time i do season two is probably going to be over because i think it starts in october so yeah it's just the reality of you know yeah the the global situation hashtag 2020 i can't imagine there being another reason why they might have yeah it, but i know very we'll true yeah we'll see more news on that as it comes up uh comic scan here we here's your comic news for for the uh episode um there's been conflicting stories and and speculation about the rise of skywalker comic adaptation it was issue number one was set to come out in may Obviously, it got delayed because of COVID and distribution issues. And then it seemed as if it was going to be canceled for a couple months here. But then the artist, I uh, forget his name. Uh, that's on me. <laughs> he uh, tweeted and he said, no, no, it's still on. Uh, it's coming out. It's just delayed. And as far as I knew, it was still set to come out in October. Now, this is interesting because... This is a regular thing now where they've been releasing adaptations of the movies like a year after they come out or six months after they come out. This happened, I think, with The Last Jedi and I think The Force Awakens. And it's really weird because, like, remember when the prequels were out? The comics, in some cases, one or two issues were already out. Yeah. You know? They they had no qualms about releasing spoiler material before they the, certainly before did the not. movies came out because uh, uh, oh i think God. the, the uh, what is it the phantom menace game for, yep i think for pc i don't remember if it was both pc and playstation came out before the movie like one of well them did. before well before at least a few weeks at i least mean they, they had weeks. a playable demo at, at celebration one right so right where we got your picture standing by the computer that you crashed yes it was a demo that's a so. preview. That's a, a preview segment for our celebration special yeah. in the upcoming episode. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, now going off uh, since that there's not much this news story anyway, but I want to go off on a related subject with these comic adaptations. Um, you know, it's it's just a weird thing because, like I said, I was always used to them coming out with the movie. It was kind of one of those things that just went hand in hand, just like the novelization. But could you imagine, <laughs> let's go back to 1999 for a minute, just like we were talking about. Can you imagine being super hyped for episode one and you're so excited and you're a massive Star Wars fan and you've read all the books and you, you've been waiting 16 years for this movie and you go, you know, well, Phantom Menace game is out. I'll just play it first. Can you imagine experiencing that story as that game before the movie? Like, not just a couple levels. Can you imagine? We, you know, we have to, we have to put the the call out for someone to, yeah, <laughs> to recall that story because I'm sure there's, I'm sure those people exist. This is an open call for uh, our listeners. If you could comment on the Facebook page or send an email to <laughs> Star Wars Unfiltered at yahoo.com. is do you know anybody out there possibly that experienced the Phantom Menace as a game? before the movie now i know there was a lot of people or not a lot but a significant portion that read the novel before the movie which i don't know why someone would do that that's weird to me like wouldn't you rather experience it star wars is so visual for me the novelizations i always want to read second because they fill in the gaps well it's whatever the primary source is right so if it's yeah if it's a if it's a movie that's coming out, you're like, oh, there's there's a source novel. I'll read the source novel, then I'll watch the movie. But uh, yeah. if it's a if it's a primarily a movie and it's just the, a novelization of the movie, yeah, that that seems odd. That, it does seem really odd. But there there is those hardcore people, and probably the people that read spoilers twenty four seven anyway. Well, yeah, just, some people just don't care about. Spoilers. Don't care. They just want to absorb it. But yeah. for me. I always had to watch the movies first, and also it was easier for me, probably because I'm a very visual person, it was always easier for me to imagine the scenes in the novel as I read it later after seeing yes. the movie. Yeah. You know, because, and that's, as a Star Wars novel fan, that's always been my way of reading the books. I'm imagining the actors say the lines, I'm imagining the sound effects, John Williams' music. Um, I've encountered nothing but disappointment. If I read a book first and then see the movie, it's always disappointing every time. So for me, um, I go backwards every time and people are like, why would you, why would you see Lord of the Rings first and then read it? And it's like, well, that's the way I work. Yeah. Well, I mean, for a lot of people, certainly with Lord of the Rings, they might've just read it before the the movies came out because it was such a big book series and stuff but it was for years so i can understand if it was like say, i mean i did the same thing I, that's how it turned out for me i watched the movies then i read the books right. later right. and there's there's some things in the books i like more than the movies and there's some things absolutely in the movies i like more than the books like absolutely certain characters are fleshed out more yeah. so motivations all that stuff right absolutely um uh, let's see. We uh, in other comic scan news, we have uh, Star Wars Adventures: Shadow of Vader's Castle one shot. Uh, that's what I read when I was reading the news. This is just a one shot. Unfortunately, maybe because of COVID, I don't know. Maybe they trimmed it down. But uh, I don't know the, how they could trim it down anymore. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it was already. It's just it's just supposed to be the 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 end of that series. I guess. maybe maybe so. Um, but I'm really looking forward to this because I was a huge fan of Tales from Vader's Castle and Return to Vader's Castle. They are actually, I think, over the last few years, they're, they're some of the few Star Wars comics where I went to the comic store and bought every issue. Mm -hmm. Because I can't say that for anything else. Um, usually I'm a trade paperback person, so I always buy the collections. But... In this case, I really wanted to support my local comic shop. Went down, bought every single one. Of course, it was kind of pricey because each one's like 
almost five bucks or four mm-hmm. bucks or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, they were really good. I've I loved that they came out week by week in October because I'm a big Halloween person. I'm a big Star Wars person, and to have these two things combined with the horror element, even if it's a kind of aim that it preteens basically with Star Wars Adventures. I loved seeing these things combined into kind of a supernatural, kind of strange uh, ghost story kind of feel. And it's you a just, good format. Yeah, it's it's a good, you it's read a good them format. Fresh. You read them fresh last night. Yeah. So, yeah. What what were your thoughts overall? Um, I liked it. Like I said, it's a good format. Um, if I'm gonna read a star wars comic i kind of like i mean even the books as much as i loved so many of the the uh full novels of the old eu and and some of the new stuff i still really liked the tales books yeah me too me too so and then for that's sort of like that kind of format in a comic form where it's like these quick little little shorts um yeah and uh, I really liked it. Uh, you know, obviously the the Dooku and the the Tarkin stories were great because they yes they call back uh, those actors' previous movies and stuff. Exactly. Um, those that was such. I mean, it was it was kind of obvious when I was reading the Dooku one, and I could see the direction it was going. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, they're gonna turn him into Dracula, like. But to see them actually do it <laughs> temporarily, you know, getting taken over by what was it? He got bit by something, or I forget. But it was like a bipedal minoc or something, <laughs> right? <laughs> but was, the target, the target one was great because it showed, like, it illustrated as, it, right? as if we needed even any more illustration of it. That Tarkin was such a hard ass, like uh, so yes. cold. Yes, you know, he, right? He would take out a whole star destroyer and everyone on it just to cover up his you know this old frankenstein monster that he- <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i just i love that they tied those into the hammer horror movies that christopher mm-hmm. lee and peter cushing did that was a master stroke of of homage and and just great stories and so even though this new one is a one shot coming out later this year uh october 28th i'm gonna be there on october 28th or 29th at my comic shop picking it up um definitely looking forward to it um even if it is a little more kid oriented they're just fun they're really fun yeah ho- and, hopefully it's uh, a little longer than a, a single yeah. comic maybe like and an annual actually, size actually uh that reminds me i think last year's free comic book day uh actually tied into i think return to vader's castle and i i think you can actually read it in between i think it's like issue two and three Mm -hmm. i'll 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 give you the list later but um the free comic book story is just another little segment of it that they i think it was written as part of it as a whole and then they kind of popped it out and they're like oh let's make this the free comic book day comic so yeah that was that but um yeah, so that's great stuff. That's coming out uh, later, October 28th. And uh, let's briefly talk about um, Dark Horse Comics versus the Disney Marvel era. Now that you've sampled a little bit of the of the current uh, Disney era of comics, and and you read you read bits and pieces of Dark Horse back in the 90s or 2000s. Yeah, I read um, a lot of Dark Horse back then. Just been so long. But it has been a long time for me too on on a lot of them but what what do you think okay so my overall my thinking is that what i liked about dark horse which i wish continued in the disney era dark horse had some really great arcs where they would just collect a trade paperback of five or six issues of something and like here's a story Whereas the Disney era, I still feel, in some ways, their hands are tied where they have to kind of write around one character that then has to tie into the new movie, whatever it is. So, oh, here's yeah. here's the Han Solo at the Academy comic, you know, ties right. into Solo. Here's, here's this, here's that. 
here's a Beckett one shot. Um, whereas Dark Horse Comics, I feel like even during the prequel era, even though there was prequel tie-ins, I feel like they had a lot more freedom to just be, hey, let's write this story ab- about uh, the Crimson Guard and and this new character of Kyrkanos and 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 what were the Crimson uh, Royal Guard about? Well, what's that about? Let's see a story about that. There was an immense freedom, and not just with Dark Horse, but Bantam and Del Rey. But um, yeah, there was. I don't know. I feel. I still kind of feel like Dark Horse was a little better. Uh, it's just a. It was a different time for comic books. I think yeah. that there was the 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 comic industry was doing better. It was at that time. Um, there was less digital reading or none really. <laughs> yeah. And it's so, it's so easy. I mean, you know, you could go and buy used comics and stuff at a comic shop, but now, I mean, you can download comics, you could pirate comics and stuff super easy. So, Very true. um, I don't know how much that hurts or helps. And, you know, obviously there's subscription services where you could legitimately read your comics digitally right. and stuff. Which is really nice because I remember getting comics uh, when I was a kid, and they'd you know fold it to fit it in the mail slot, and I'd get all bummed I know, out. I um, know. So not having to worry about stuff like that. Right. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, there was just more freedom because the industry was healthier at the time, and there was more uh, money to be made, I guess. Yeah, and that's true. You could have, you know, the Tales of the Jedi comics that didn't really have anything to do with um, any of the modern movies or series or anything, books. It, it could just be its own thing set thousands of years in the past and be supported by itself, not have to support some other thing, some other yeah. thing that's coming out. Um, in general, I mean that's kind of the issue that a lot of the Disney stuff has where it's, it's designed and, and, and pushed out to support a movie or a series. Yeah. Um, it's give and take. There's, there's a good part of that and there's a bad part. And I yeah, think the, at the, the great, the great part about that is that it, it, um, it connects everything. It ties better. in. It always it, ties in. Yeah. And you do feel like if you read a comic before you see a movie, you do get some insight into things. And the same thing with the novels. I, I had fun reading Catalyst right before seeing Rogue One because then I had so much background on Galen Erso and his wife and Krennic. And that was a good example of of story group giving an author, in this case James Luceno, you know, uh, a chance to tie into something really in depth. Um, I guess, yeah, at the end of the day, it's just a different era. There's there's no going home <laughs> to how <laughs> the Dark Horse comics used to do things. Unless there's, you know, some resurgence of print media or, or not True. even print, but just like, you know, uh, more people buying comics, but... And actually, you know, this brings up an interesting subject. Since we're on this break between Star Wars movies, and, and we've briefly talked about this before, but um, there is this great opportunity to, for there to be story freedom right now. Other than The Mandalorian, and they have a couple things tying in, or maybe Squadrons, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit, Uh there's a great freedom right now to do some different stuff. And I think that's what the high Republic might be kind of going for. They have a big gap here to kind of fill out and do, I don't want to say like new Jedi order, but like a, um, kind of like a thing where they get some authors together, do a round table and go off on a different thing that doesn't necessarily tie into just promoting the latest movie. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. I mean, it just depends on what Disney. You know, part of the problem is that Disney is hurting right now. They they're not being supported by their theme parks like yeah. they could. They're not. Um, they're not being supported by their movies. I mean, you know, they just finished out the 
what phase four of the MCU, and they're you know having to get that that machine running again with building up to whatever they were going to do in the future phases. And it's it's sort of uh, they don't have movies and theme parks to rely on to to keep the the money flowing. So right, I could see a lot of stuff being drawn back. It's sort of um, one of the things that has been an asset for like a, a, a channel like HBO to be able to spend money on on these big series that they've done, like Game of Thrones, is the fact that they have these subscriber numbers. Netflix yes. the same thing. They have this this built in revenue stream where they do, it's not totally reliant on the actual individual content they make. They just have to make good content and they can experiment and still, you know, have that money flowing in. Disney doesn't. They don't have that extra money right now. So right. Very every, true. Everybody, everybody's hurting, you know. Yep. Very true. And that, in, in a way, it's kind of a blessing because, <laughs> personally, it gives me more time to catch up on older, older new books from last year and the year before. Yeah, there's a lot even of stuff longer. to catch up on. There's yeah, tons to catch up on. I've been wanting to read some of the sequel tie-in books for a few years now, like Phasma and um some of the other stuff like that i haven't even read the last jedi novelization you know i gotta read that um so yeah there, it just gives me more time and i still want to read tons of legend stuff too so it's okay yeah i don't mind having a big break um so yeah okay it's interesting uh you know we'll, we'll probably we'll, we're going to be covering more dark horse comics individually in the near future on later episodes but I kind of wanted to touch on that and uh, how they relate to the current era because it's an interesting subject. And, and and again, just like a lot of things, I feel like like kind of like with the older Legends novels, I, I kind of feel like uh, the contributions of Dark Horse have been shuffled under the carpet in some way, you know, but it was huge. I mean, there was massive, there was huge stuff, especially with the Tales of the Jedi. Stuff. Yeah, Dark Empire, and luckily, since the ownership of the collected trade paperbacks switched to Marvel, Marvel can reprint those under their banner, which is cool. You know, you, you'll see those big omnibuses of the Dark Horse stuff under the Marvel banner, so yeah. that's awesome. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be covering more individual comics in the near future, and uh, let's see... That wraps it up for our first episode of Star Wars Unfiltered. Uh, in the next episode, we're going to be covering uh, Star Wars games of the 90s, general memories about that, as well as Tales from Galaxy's Edge, the upcoming VR experience. We have a little news segment on that. The latest news on Star Wars Squadrons. New Horizons, the role-playing roundup, where we give our West End Games memories, as well as Collector's Comlink, where we are going to be talking about the Star Wars trilogy and how we first experienced it on television, as well as the various VHS, DVD, and Blu-ray releases over the years, including the special editions. So, that should be good. Uh, remember, if you want to check us out, uh, Star Wars Unfiltered, we have our Facebook page. Just look up Star Wars Unfiltered at Facebook. We have uh, Star Wars Unfiltered at Instagram. Please check that out. We have Star Wars Unfiltered at YouTube. Just look up that keyword or series of words and you'll see some archival material up there. More to come soon. And we welcome any questions or comments. Uh, we'll be having further uh, reader comments. We'll have a little section on that in further episodes. Just email us at Star Wars Unfiltered at Yahoo.com. And until then, we will catch you on the very next episode.